In far northern Queensland, between Atherton and Innisfail, is a small town called Malinda. About 16 kilometres from there is an abandoned gold mine named Boonji, in the shadow of Mount Bartle Freer. It was nearby that a settler named James Ginn had a property in the 1920s. He had employed two young men to help clear the scrub for a farm. It was a lonely place to live and work and die. The two men were named Frederick Charles Walters, who was an Englishman aged 27 or 19 by some accounts, and Joseph Michael Kelly, a 21-year-old Victorian. Walters had arrived in Australia about September 1927. He was said to have a short temper and a tendency to want to fight. Kelly, on the other hand, was better liked in the locality, as he was seen to be more even-tempered. They lived in a rough bush camp on site while clearing a 30-acre paddock. It was said that the pair had not gotten on too well and frequently argued. They had been in the district since January, meeting at a camp in Malanda for the unemployed seeking work. They teamed up and working for a Russian emigrant felling trees and building fences, before moving on to clear scrub for gin, which they had been doing for about three or four months, when they both suddenly vanished about the end of June or start of July 1928. As they still owed money to local storekeepers and for the purchase of their horses, it was assumed the men had decided to leave without paying their debts. Hence why their disappearance raised no immediate concerns. The pair were last seen alive and well on the 28th of June by an acquaintance. There appeared to be no animosity between the pair. Two weeks after their disappearance, Jin officially reported them missing, but it seems little was done to locate them. The camp was not searched, even though one of the men's horses was found nearby. Jin had passed the hut three times a week, but never looked inside. Five weeks passed, and it was on the morning of the 6th of August, 1928, that two carpenters, also employed by Jin to build a house, were on their way to work, when they were assailed by a dreadful stench. The men decided to seek out the cause of the foul smell, possibly guessing what was causing it, for they searched for two hours before they located the source. About 70 to 80 yards from the bush camp where the scrub fellows had lived, a carpenter named James Snodgrass, found the decomposing remains of one of the men. He had been battered to death, and as if to ensure he was dead, the killer had then decapitated the corpse for good measure. A doctor later reconstructed the crime and believed the first blow was delivered from behind on the back of the head before the ferocious battering was meted out. The killing had taken place in the camp. Blood-stained clothing was later found inside. The corpse was quickly identified, as that of Frederick Walters. The murderer had dragged Walters' body by the feet into the scrub and left it. Strangely, had the body been taken in the opposite direction, there was a gorge into which it could have been dropped. It was believed that had that been done, the body may have never been found. The drag marks leading away from the hut were clearly evident. Uncertain whether Kelly had murdered Walters, or whether a third person had killed both men, Police searched the area for Kelly, dead or alive, but came up with no clues. His description was aged 21, 5 foot 8, fresh flushed complexion, sandy curly hair, a prominent nose, missing two upper teeth, and with long features. He usually tilted his head to one side while conversing, and was slightly stooped. He was wearing a blue serge suit and a soft grey felt hat. He often wore white sand shoes. A farmer spoke to Kelly on the afternoon of June 29th as the latter rode towards Malinda. The next day, Kelly left his horse near the Gillies Highway and hitched a lift into Cairns. On the 13th of August, a man named Arthur Lewis came forward with information. At the start of July, he and others had been camped by the train line south of Cairns, when a stranger, looking somewhat dishevelled and tired, carrying a canvas bag, had entered their camp. He had arrived at about 6.15pm and ate a meal of camp pie with tea. The man was described as about 21 to 22 years of age, 5 foot 9 and a half, medium build with reddish complexion and curly sandy coloured hair. He was wearing a blue serge suit with dark trousers and a grey felt hat. 
The young man said he had been working for a farmer at Mallander, clearing bush, but had had a row with his mate and the farmer, who hadn't paid him, causing him to clear out without even his swag. He had ridden a horse part of the way, then hitched a ride on a lorry the rest of it. He said his intention was to head to Cairns and jump a cattle train heading south, which had been the means he used to arrive in Queensland. He inferred that he had been in Western Australia at some time, and added that he could change his name. Why he would mention that last snippet of information is not clear. On the 3rd of August, a man of the exact same description appeared at another camp south of Cairns, at Gordonvale. During a meal, another man remarked that he couldn't eat steak. The stranger said, Me too, and opened his mouth to reveal he was missing two teeth from his upper jaw. When somebody called out to another man named Michael Kelly, the stranger turned around immediately. He explained that he reacted as he did because his name was Kelly. When he left the following morning, he was travelling towards Alumba. On the 13th of August, having read of the discovery of the body at Boonji, the men contacted the police and identified Kelly from a photograph they were shown. Acting on the information from the men, on the 15th of August, Kelly's black horse was found by police with saddle and bridle on it, in the scrub, about a half mile from the paddock's top gate. They also located the lorry driver, who had given Kelly a lift. Despite this lead, the five-week interval hampered the search, and Kelly could not be located. Then it was announced in early September that an arrest had been made. A man answering the description of Kelly had gained employment as a stoker on a Swedish steamship called the Siddick. The ship left Brisbane on the 3rd of July and called in at Cairns a few days later, where three stokers were taken on. The man believed to be Kelly was arrested at Gravesend, England, when it birthed, and was charged with murder. The man denied the murder, and he also denied he was Joseph Kelly. The man said he was Hubert Storey, and about the only thing he had in common with Kelly was the same age. Storey was six foot tall, some four inches taller than Kelly. He was born and raised in Oxford, and had an English accent. He had gone to Australia as a dreadnought boy, a scheme to send British teenage boys to learn farming that was undertaken between 1911 and 1939. He had spent a few months at an agricultural college in 1925, before tramping about New South Wales and Queensland seeking employment. Unable to find a permanent position, he had worked for a time for Worth's Circus, a famous Australian entertainment, before arriving in Cairns. He decided he would go to Rhodesia and join his brother, who was an estate manager there. At Bow Street Court, Hubert's story was released from custody, and the Boonji mystery remained unresolved. The next breakthrough in the case occurred on the 8th of January 1929, when a man walked into the police station on Thursday Island, north of Queensland, and said he was Joseph Kelly, confessed to the murder, and said he was prepared to take whatever was coming to him. Possibly as a result of the false lead with story in England, police were cautious. The man was brought to Queensland, and there revealed to be a liar, whose real name was Gordon Franks. He had been anxious to reach the mainland, so he had made a false confession so that would, he would be brought back. His knowledge of the crime had been derived from newspaper accounts. In July of that year, a rumour swept the Atherton Tableland and Cairns that the skeleton of James Kelly had been found in a gorge. Once more, the story proved to be false. Nothing had been found. The case began to grow colder. Walter's body had been buried near where he was slain at Boonji. In 1930, a local named Mr. Jackson, a collector for the Deaf and Dumb Institute, saw that it was rough and neglected. He described it as being like a dog's grave. Jackson carried a sack of white quartz stones a quarter of a mile on his back to use to outline the grave, to make a cross and the initials FW. He also planted a palm at the bottom right-hand corner of the grave. A man named Davis provided a headboard which read, in memory of F. Walters, murdered at Boonji. Davis was an amateur photographer who had passed the camp a week before the murder and had been asked by Walters to take his photo. Davis was busy and promised to take the photo, 
the next time he passed. Then in January 1933, a skeleton was discovered at the bottom of a mine shaft in Tawalla, with tattered clothing still clinging to the remains. It was suspected the body would be that of Joseph Kelly, but for one final time hopes were dashed. The body when recovered was identified as Edmund Dwyer, a 72-year-old miner who had been missing for two years. There was speculation he was a second victim of the Boonji murderer, but no evidence of murder was proven. No trace of Joseph Michael Kelly was ever found. Some conjectured at the time that a third person had killed both men, but Kelly's presence at the camps near Cairns would rule that out. Possibly Walters was killed after Kelly left, but Kelly's disappearance and silence thereafter is suspicious. The mystery at Boonji remains forever in that twilight of the unsolved, the dark corners of history.